Laong nan mga tiguyang ang palibot ay nagbag-o na ug saan amo barangay tagtabangan ng EDB para paghimo ng siwol para protektahan ang kabayajan sa pagtaas ng tubig. Mablang Dorishel ay bangkyo sa Rush ana ina do pa do de hamas sa change garden ana o di agon khatar na dora o di na bait shloki tarap na ba shloki tarap. My company is providing the solar energy solutions for building and household and solar farm. Uh, I'd like to lead the clean energy sectors to the communities and uh, like to spread up the knowledge to all over the Asia. If you do it in a clever way, I mean climate action, you will create new opportunities for doing business actually. Yeah? The Asian Development Bank is committing $80 billion cumulatively between the year 2019 and 2030 to combat climate change and to build climate and disaster resilience in the Asia-Pacific region. This makes us the first regional development bank to make such an ambitious commitment. In addition, we will ensure that 75% of our portfolio of projects will integrate climate change considerations by the year 2030. I think it's about time to get started. Um, I believe we have a few people who will trickle in um, from the dining room, but um, in the interest of time, I think we better get going. So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to our plenary session on resilience of industry and the built environment. Um, we have a great roster of, of panelists and speakers who will contribute to a very informative and, and thought provoking session this afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Lynch and I've been with ADB for over 20 years now in various capacities, but I'm currently the Deputy Director General for our Pacific Department. Um, I'd like to now introduce our, our speakers very briefly. Um, our speakers include Ms. Esther Jang. You can raise your hand, Esther. Um, Esther's from Bloomberg. Yes, you can give her an applause. Um, and she's responsible for managing environmental, social, and government data. So that's ESG data. 
and also collaborating with policymakers, corporations, and global investors on using and benefiting from ESG data. Our another speaker is our very own Shan Fu Lu, who is our senior climate change specialist with ADB, where she also serves as our climate change adaptation focal for our bank-wide operations. Shan Fu. We also have with us Mr. Mark Fletcher, who currently leads Arab's global water business. And he's also working with the Rockefeller Foundation on water resilience assessments of cities across the world. So welcome. <laughs> and we have Mr. Tony Wong, who's the chief executive of the Cooperative Research Center for Water Sensitive Cities. And he has pioneered the water sensitive cities approach, which has been mainstreamed across Australia, but is increasingly uh, being mainstreamed across a number of cities in developing countries throughout Asia and the Pacific. So, big hand for Tony. And uh, last but not least, we have Mr. David Simmons, who is the managing director of the Capital Science and Policy Practice with Willis Towers Watson, and he specializes in developing models of catastrophic natural hazards and their impacts to really identify appropriate risk management and mitigation instruments and programs. So again, as I said, we've got a great program ahead of us. Um, that's right, give David a hand. Okay, let me quickly just give you an overview of our, our session. Um, we will begin with the presentation by Esther on um, essentially an overview of risks and opportunities and then we'll turn to some solutions. And the solutions include policy and regulatory frameworks, design and engineering solutions, nature-based approaches, as well as financing. So maybe without further ado, I will um, begin with Esther Jang, who will talk about the risks and opportunities of climate change and really drawing upon some of the data and recommendations from the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD. Esther, thanks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very delighted to be here and discuss about uh, risks and opportunities of climate change. For those of you who are not familiar with Bloomberg, Bloomberg is often known as media company, but we also provide financial and non-financial data like environmental, social, and governance, and supply chains and new energy finance to more than 300,000 users around the world. Uh, to support their business and investments. And today, I would like to talk about the risks and opportunities of climate change and provide you an overview of the 2018 TCFT status report. Can you? Sorry. Probably um, most of you will remember the Superstorm Sandy that caused billions of dollars in damage and killed over a hundred in the east coast of the states in 2012. It was the second most for any year on record. And at that time, many giant data centers suffered from floods and uh, power shutdown because of the Sandy. While, sorry about that. Okay. While Bloomberg's data centers stayed on during the storm, but their location on the coast of Manhattan became a clear risk. So we had to move entire data center upstate to build resilience for our company. This, this was the uh, location of the data center. The chronic risk from changes in global temperatures also pose risks to investors. Uh, like extreme heat can lead to increased cost to cool down machinery and increased cost to insure assets and lower labor efficiency. This kind of climate related risk is not a certain country or company's issues, but it could affect any company through their supply chain or customers. And it could bring either direct or indirect financial impact to the business. Uh, 
The TCFD recommendations well defines the risks and opportunity of the climate change, and this is the key goal of the task force's work. In order to make more informed financial decisions, data users need to understand how climate-related risk and opportunities are likely to impact on an organization's financial position as reflected in uh, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. And the financial impacts are driven by the specific climate-related risks and opportunities to which the organization is exposed and its strategic planning and risk management decisions on managing those risks and seizing opportunities. The task force categorized the risk as transition and physical. The transition risk will, is related to the transition to a lower carbon economy, and it may entail extensive policy, technology, uh, market, and uh, reputations uh, to address mitigation and adaptation uh, requirement related to the climate change. The physical risk is related to the physical impacts by the climate change. It can be event-driven, like cyclone, hurricane, and flood, or it can be longer-term shifts in climate pattern, like sea level rise or chronic wave. The TF upper, uh, classifies the opportunities into five different areas. Resource efficiency, uh, energy source, product and services, market, and resilience. The concept of uh, resilience includes um, involves developing adaptive capacity to respond to climate change to better manage the associated risks and opportunities. And it, it includes improving efficiency or designing new production processes or developing new products. For those of you who are not familiar with the TCFD, let me explain a little bit about the background. Recognizing uh, inadequate or inconsistent uh, information about the climate change issues, the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors asked the Financial Stability Board to review how financial sectors can take account of climate-related issues. In response, in December 2015, the FSB established an industry-led task force on climate-related financial disclosures to design a set of recommendations for more effective disclosures that are needed by investors, lenders, and insurance underwriters for better assessment and pricing on climate-related risks and opportunities. The FSB appointed Michael Bloomberg uh, the founder of Bloomberg and former mayor of New York City as a chairman, and they selected 31 task force members across the globe from various organizations, including financial, non-financial, uh, credit rating agencies, and consulting. The TF released its final report in June last year and structured its recommendations around four thematic areas that represent core elements of how companies operate. Those are governance, um, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. Each of the four recommendations is supported by two to three recommended disclosures uh, that uh, organizations can include in their financial filings to provide more decision useful information. And this recommendation solicit information that is primarily forward-looking, and the TF wants to further develop the limited disclosures of financial risk posed by the climate-related impacts. In addition to the final report, the TF published supplemental guidance to provide more industry-specific uh, context and details that organizations should consider in their um, disclosures under the TCFD recommendations. While every industry could experience potential financial impacts, uh, but the TF identified 18 non-financial industries more likely to be financially impacted due to their exposures to certain risks around greenhouse gas emissions or energy or GHG, uh, or water dependencies. And the TF prepared a high-level overview of financial impacts in four different areas 
as revenues, expenditures, asset and liabilities, and capital and financing. Currently with the TCFD, we are working on two main items. The first is growing the list of supporters. Um, showing supports uh, on our public list implies that uh, you are already working on the TCFD recommendations and it is a helpful way to build momentum and increase impact in the market. Currently, we have 500 companies um, who have publicly uh, disclosed their support for the TCFD. By implementing the recommendation, there are a couple of benefits. You can better access to the capital and you can meet the existing requirements and also you can proactively address the investor's demand for the climate-related info. The task force has been undertaking various initiatives uh, to promote adoption of recommendation and support companies in their implementation. As of last week, there were more than 70 uh, Asia-Pacific supporters. And if you join, you can demonstrate your leadership in this area along with the global leading groups. As part of efforts to promote the recommendations, the TF released 2018 status report at the One Planet Summit in New York three weeks ago. It provides an overview of current disclosure practices found from several hundred of financial filings and sustainable reports. It is important to note that the TF has not attempted to assess the level of adoption of the recommendations, nor whether the existing climate-related financial disclosures fully meet the um, recommendation. Instead, it provides an additional information to support companies with examples of disclosures aligned with the recommendations. And it provides user and preparer perspectives, as well as a summary of major initiatives that support TCFD. Overall, the task force found out majority of companies disclosed uh, climate-related information, at least one uh, aligned with the recommendations, but further work is needed to contain more decision-useful info. And financial implication of climate-related uh, issues should be disclosed more, and the resilience of the company's strategy should be developed more. Uh, these are the key takeaways, and I'm looking for uh, more supporters after this forum, and I'm looking, um, looking for more developments from next year's uh, report. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if, okay, thank you, Esther. Um, Again, that was a really informative presentation, and I, I have to take this opportunity since you mentioned um, Hurricane Sandy. Um, when I was thinking about this session yesterday, I did a little quick research and um, really wanted to, to kind of understand the economic impact of some natural disasters. And uh, I guess being from the United States, that was a good place to start. And here are just some numbers that I picked up from the uh, internet yesterday. Um, you know, the cost of Hurricane Michael, which uh, slammed into Florida just a week ago, they're still calculating the numbers, but the cost, the economic cost is estimated to exceed $125 billion. And Hurricane Florence, which hit uh, North Carolina just, you know, a month ago in September, resulted in, a, in at least $22 billion of damage. Um, you think, I think all of you remember um, Hurricane Maria, which went through Dominica and Puerto Rico last year. That left $90, million, $90 billion in damages. Irma, which hit Florida, resulted in an economic cost of $15 billion. And then there was Hurricane Harvey, which passed through Texas in August last year. And that left $125 billion um, in damages in its wake. So again, I think that the work that TCFD is doing um, and some of the rec recommendations and action plans, especially for corporations, are, are really important for helping companies uh, but also, in some cases, countries uh, strengthen resilience. So thank you very much, Esther, for that. Um, now we're going to turn to uh, Ms. Shanfu Lu, who will focus on some of the policy and regulatory frameworks for strengthening climate resilience. Shanfu? 
Thank you, Jim. I think I will disappear behind this podium. Uh, um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And um, it's very uh, good that Esther uh, came before me and highlighted some of the um, initiatives the TCFD is um, uh, undertaken. We all often say what um, what cannot be measured cannot be managed. So we need to have the idea of what is actually at stake, and the disclosure is the first step, I think. Um, so I will now. Um, So we have the overview of what's involved, what is at stake in terms of the scope of uh, risks and opportunities of climate change for the key economic sectors and the built environment. And um, we are very optimistic panel, as you can see, one person talking about risks, and we have four providing solutions. So I will start with uh, some of the uh, solutions lying in the area of policy and the regulations. So we will know um, policies and regulations are very effective guides to govern, to dictate the um, business operations, market behavior, and some of the investment uh, decisions. And so when it comes to talk about, when we talk about climate resilience building and risk management, uh, policies and regu regulations have a very important role to play. And um, here, I just want to provide us three indicative examples. There are many more, I'm sure, in the policy regulation arena. So the first one is um, uh, in uh, 2010, the UK government uh, uh, passed the uh, Flood and the uh, Water Management Act. So the purpose of this act is really to provide a better pro uh, uh, protection of people, homes, and businesses against the flood risk um, now and also under changing climate. And it does so um, through um, a few um, um, uh, concrete action areas. So it, uh, the act itself provides uh, uh, an introduction of some of the key concepts like flood risks and uh, um, risk management and some of the um, uh, authority and the division of uh, responsibilities between different uh, key players in the in the uh, 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 flood risk management uh, process, and it also provides uh, definitions of some of the key terminology: uh, what is flood, what is local um, service runoff, and what is the uh, when it comes to responsibility, who should take the re responsibility, the local uh, flood authority, and so on. Um, so uh, in addition to providing the uh, general instructions and the definitions, the act essentially also provides a set of requirements for the relevant authorities to carry out. Um, so the first thing, they want a uh, preliminary flood risk assessment report which would provide a uh, very high level overview of the, the risks and identify some of the risk uh, hotspots. And then for those hotspots identified, they need to provide a uh, flood hazard and the risk maps. And we will know um, risk is, uh, is, is a function of um, you know, the presence of hazard and, and exposure and the adaptive capacity. So they are different things. They need to be reported separately. And finally, the once the hotspots are identified, you can't just leave a place uh, at risk. You need to come up with a risk management plan. So this is a um, very sort of um, a simple national level um, uh, legislation, piece of legislation to help enhance the resilience against the flood risks. And through the implementation of this act in the past the seven, eight years, a um, national and, and the local authorities mobilized the, the local communities and come up with a very wide range of uh, actions and, and, uh, and the creative um, solutions, quite practical ones, and, uh, and to enhance the resilience of the very local communities. I think I noticed quite a few experts from the UK, so I shall outsource uh, responding to any difficult questions later on to, to these experts. And so the second uh, example I want to provide here is in the space of um, uh, the, the finance and, uh, and the industry uh, area. So building on what um, Esther already presented, the 
the financial sector, um, how the how they are addressing climate risk and the building resilience of uh, of the industry and businesses. Um, so we um, uh, following this first batch of um, disclosures of companies following the TCFD uh, recommendation, a lot of companies actually reported material risks of climate change to the business operations and physical assets. And so there's, um, there's little uh, surprise when uh, uh, weather and climate related events are very high on the agenda during those uh, top level uh, corporate, the CEOs, when they announce their um, quarterly, um, what you call the earnings calls and, and the climate weather events are often uh, featured very prominently as you can see from this graph. And this is how many times weather climate events have been mentioned in those um, earnings calls. So it's featured more prominently than the fluctuation in the, in the oil price, in the dollar value, uh, than the recession and even Trump. So, um, so this has uh, become a quite, uh, quite a uh, dominant theme in the business uh, uh, community as well. And um, so taking into account this um, you know, emerging, uh, emerging uh, risk of, um, oops, this, um, and, and the taken, taken uh, cue from the uh, information emerging from these different disclosures and the financial reports, or sustainability reports of the big companies, and the ratings agencies have been busy to try to fix the uh, factor in uh, climate risks into the uh, credit um, worthiness ratings for sovereign nations, for uh, states, uh, for municipalities, and even for investment instruments. So one of the examples here I'm showing is the um, they do these uh, uh, ratings to um, uh, primarily through two different channels. So one is to actually directly factor in climate risks and the resilience to risk in the overall uh, credit rating. Um, and uh, by looking at you know how what is in place to ensure resilience against the climate change impacts, the, the a a, um, a a entity uh, or a um, investment instrument can be upgraded or downgraded by several notches. So and another way to look at the climate risk in the credit worthiness is to assess the uh, the investment instruments, for example, green bonds. So this is the example I'm showing here um, is the uh, standard and the pools, um, uh, green bond evaluation framework. And uh, you can see here, they um, uh, use the uh, three or four different uh, categories to look at, the, um, look at the evaluation score. So they uh, think about the transparency, they look at the governance of the, the bond and then considering the benefits of mitigation and adaptation, uh, essentially for adaptation, they look at the resilience benefits the investment delivers. Um, and there's a whole lot of um, uh, technical details behind all this uh, uh, framework. So um, the overall message is that the market is now taking climate risks very uh, seriously and, um, and the pricing into the, into the risks. Sorry, I, um, so the last one, and uh, I wanted to also um, uh, indicate the uh, in international fin fin financial institutions uh, are, are taking uh, climate risks very, in, uh, in, uh, very seriously and have been busy internalizing the risk management framework in our regular business processes. So this is a, a diagram. Um, illustrating how ADB here, we, we do our lending operations. So from the early stage of a uh, project the conceptualization, we look at the uh, climate risks using a uh, very crude, uh, sort of simple initial climate risk screening process. And then if a project is uh, deemed that um, medium or high risk, we carry out a uh, very detailed climate risk and adaptation assessments during the project preparation phase. And this is typically um, taking place during the project due diligence uh, and uh, feasibility study. And then we um, provide 
uh, and we identify, evaluate, and, and prioritize interventions to address those risks identified. So all this is um, internalized in our in our project cycle and the information related to climate risks and the risk management uh, plans are documented in the project board paper. And this is a, just the example of how we register uh, the relevant information. I would uh, point to Esther, actually, we are not only supporting the TCFD recommendation, we are implementing, we are actually going beyond. We are not just disclosing, we are actually actively managing. So. Um, I would stop here and um, uh, looking forward to some discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean Fu. And um, again, while you're sitting here, maybe I'll give you and Esther a question to ponder that we can discuss later. But again, I guess the real question here is how to encourage um, both countries and companies to really invest in policy and regulatory frameworks to reduce risks and, and increase resilience. So again, I'll leave that with you to think about. Um, but um, continuing with the theme of solutions and for resilience, I'd like to uh, ask Mark Fletcher to uh, give us his presentation on water resilience, how cities are, are trying to cope, especially through design and engineering solutions. Mark. Uh, thanks very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, in the graveyard spot after lunch, I thought I'd give you a, a little bit of food for thought. You can groan at that. A number of things to consider. So um, a couple of weeks ago, along with quite a few people here, I was at the World Water Congress in Japan. And um, in the opening plenary, the chair of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change said that water-related natural disasters had tripled since 1980. Taking on board the fact that more people now live in cities than in rural areas and, and urbanizations accelerating, we saw this need to look at very much water, water resilience for cities. So where did we start from? We thought, well, we'd start from a framework of understanding and work we'd done with Rockefeller Foundation, looking at the city resilience framework and the city resilience index. So imagine we, we take that and then we sort of apply a water lens. So this is our maturity assessment. I, I can normally do this in about 30 slides and build a really exciting story, but let's say we're cut into the chase. What we're really doing therefore, we're applying a water lens to a city looking at resilience. Um, it's a maturity assessment, so we'd look at against um, a, a number of criteria. Uh, how mature is that city or how, how resilient is that city to a series of shocks and stresses that we'd apply? Some of the things that's really fundamental, and it's been reinforced in the earlier presentations today and yesterday, is that it's at a catchment or basin scale. This isn't at a city boundary scale. So that's a really fundamental thing. From that, you then identify, if you like, where your gaps are. You then think, what are those options to bridge those gaps? And I don't mean just building infrastructure. I mean, what are the social or environmental, what are the ways in which we might bridge those gaps? So we then look at those options, how we prioritize them, and then we look at implementation and as you can imagine, then we'd have feedback, we'd have monitoring, um, and an element of assurance. So that's sort of our approach to water resilience of cities. And uh, it's, um, we're currently in the process of running pilots in Cape Town, uh, Miami, uh, Mexico, Amman, uh, Hull, doesn't, it doesn't quite, it's not quite as exotic as all the rest. And we are looking at extending in our third wave cities to ASEAN cities so that we can start to get very much the context of this region. But we thought we'd share this at the stage that it's at. Um, and we've got cities who are keen to come on board. And I think the more cities we get, the more that we can test and challenge and, if you like, um, knock some of the edges off what we're doing. 
Now, these cities, they're all of different sizes and scales, and as you can imagine, uh, experience different shocks and stresses. Another really fundamental thing as part of our approach is, and again, this has been mentioned, is to think about governance. And that's governance across a water cycle that we subsequently shock and stress. So, for instance, no one organization is control, in control of the whole water cycle. This was just some early work that we did. And at the moment, we're working with OECD and CIWI, Stockholm International Water Institute. But this just says shows that across that water cycle, there's a whole range of organizations who have responsibilities. So when you map those, what's really important is those organizations are engaging with, with each other and we look at the relationships across that water cycle and how effective they are. So another thing, this is why someone, I've, I've just won the bet to manage to get a pizza into the middle of a presentation after lunch. I think I spent the first 20 years of my career thinking that cities are like this. They're like the pizza where each slice is a different city system. And we thought we could solve the problems in our slice by just restricting ourselves to talking to the people within that slice. So cities don't work like that. There you go. They're, they're much more complicated. They're a system of systems. They're the power. We, we, we implement smart water and the power knocks out the the smart system that we've just put in place. We get a flood warning, so we, the police stop all the, um, close down all the roads, stop all the transport, and the operators to operate some of the, the flood control systems can't get to the locations they should be, and then therefore our flooding is exacerbated. There's, there's numerous examples of these. So I've, I've drawn some um, inspiration uh, from the Venice Biennale, and that's uh, thinking about when these things happen, sometimes um, our system of systems uh, results in us getting shocks. Those shocks being serious or sudden or rapid, they might be unpredictable, overwhelming, or even apocalyptic. So this, for me, is what a city's more like. It's more like this squadgy, interconnected, you know, you can't separate one bit from the other. So how do we cope when these interconnected systems get uh, stressed and shocked? And I think in the past we've over relied on infrastructure robustness. And I think going forward, I think there's a lot more opportunity for us to look into our organizational coping strategies making sure we've got our available supply chain and then making sure we've got the critical resources that we might need. And coming back to Tokyo, I learned an awful lot from listening to a huge number of disasters where they've been learning things from those disasters. Things like decentralizing our systems rather than centralizing them, which we may have done in the past because we wanted to save money or whatever. So um, the slide I'd leave you with is this coping cycle. So are we really doing enough? Let's just assume that whatever shock has, has happened and whatever, whatever uh, infrastructure resilience or robustness we've put in place hasn't worked. So have we thought through what could we have done before that shock hit us? What could we have done during the shock and what could we have done afterwards? And that curve you could attach to loss of life or you could attach to damage. And I think maybe because we've asked the question to engineers in the past, we've looked an awful lot at engineering. Oh, it doesn't work. Engineering that point just where the shock starts because... That, that sort of, we delay when that happens. When the reality is that as, the, as everything gets increasingly more severe, and we may even get shocks on shocks, 
it's important that we look into the other space. So uh, that's the uh, food for thought I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. And um, again, I, I, I take your point that, um, you know, the engineering approach is not always the solution in and of itself. And I guess one thing that I've been looking at, especially in the context of um, urban areas across the Pacific, is um, the consequence of, of not addressing or strengthening resilience. Because I think that, um, you know, the concept of internal or social vulnerability comes forward. Um, given the high concentration of populations in urban areas, in the Pacific, but also throughout the world, many cities are, are located along the coast. And again, you know, the, um, the problems are is that uh, the lack of sufficient resilience measures um, and planning ahead um, can result in social instability and, and big conflicts and, and again, um, the lack of security, at least on the social side. So again, um, I think we're going to continue with the theme on uh, urban resilience with Tony Wong, um, who will describe how the water-sensitive cities approach is helping urban areas respond to the challenges of climate change and water ma management. Um, so, Tony, over to you. Thank you, James, and good afternoon. As uh, James said, uh, this session is really about um, resilience in the built environment. And I just want to spend a little bit of time to talk about why that is such an important challenge for us. And I'll start with this slide with the, the notion that uh, you know, urbanization is going to ultimately uh, refocus for us the whole concept of, of resilience in the built environment for a number of reasons. One is that, that the greatest growth in terms of urbanization is in our region, is in Africa and it's in Asia. The issue about urban places is that it really is uh, a microcosm of many challenges all put into one big melting pot. And we need to think about resilience from that perspective. We need to think about the multifacet of resilience, whether it is resilience from an energy perspective or resilience from a water perspective or transport perspective, they are all lumped into how a city functions. So resilience, within an urban environment, really need to think about all the multifacet of multiple resilience issues that we need to bring together uh, to build resilience within, within the city. And we find, for instance, that okay, that in cities there are multiple drivers, multiple criteria, multiple scenarios. And the best, perhaps, I could sort of bring it together are uh, an area that, that we certainly have worked a lot in in, in, uh, in our center. Uh, three key issues, sustainability, resilience, and livability. We cannot, uh, we cannot ignore the fact that city function because of the people. And people really have much stronger focus if you, if you did a survey on what's important to them today. It is about livability. If you survey practitioners like us, uh, it would be perhaps more about sustainability and resilience. Our responses to all those three can sometimes be competing, can sometimes be different. And I really want to explore that in terms of how we would build this. Suffice to say that you cannot have a resilience strategy without having a focus on looking at how that also improves sustainability, climate mitigation, and also improves livability, without which you'll find that within our society, community will not continue to support a resilient strategy. So what, what's the subtle difference between the three? I put it really simply, and I'm trying to break it into very simple language in, in, in the talk that I present to communities. Often sustainability is really about the carrying capacity of our city, of the environment, of planet Earth. And you find that, in fact, there are many situations whereby we have exceeded the ecological footprint, the planetary boundaries, and we are seeing the symptoms of exceeding that caring capacity. And when that happens, we need to think about our coping capacity. How do we actually start to think about adaptation to withstand and recover from climatic shocks? That is resilience. 
And resilience in itself is also a combination of those four that we've heard about, the four pillars, which can be broken up into social resilience, institutional financing, community, as well as infrastructure resilience, the biophysical environment, both grey infrastructure and our ecological systems. And finally, livability is really about our comfort capacity of our city, ability of our system to support the, the quality of living, quality of life that continue to actually support a lot of our initiative in resilience and sustainability. One of the biggest debate that we have these days uh, in many communities, including Australia, is that livability and sustainability appears to be mutually exclusive. It's one or the other. And in fact, that's where you get the type of political uh, situations that we face because we cannot reconcile those issues, while in fact we should. Now, I want to run through this very quickly in terms of from a nature-based solution perspective, I'm delighted that uh, during World Water Day early this year, that the United Nations launched this report, Nature-Based Solution for Water, and some of the quotes that, are, that I've extracted from that. The significance of this report really is the fact that it is being now uh, linked, nature-based solutions are being linked to the delivery of Agenda 2030. It, to some degree, legitimizes throughout the 195 countries that have signed up to Agenda 2030, the role of nature-based solution. And it won't be long before accounting practices um, will start to think of green infrastructure as infrastructure, as assets that require uh, valuation, that require us to report that as an asset, and that require us to think about the overall maintenance of that asset to provide essential services. This is the same uh, diagram from that report, which I really want to talk about what is the type, what are some of the ecosystem services that we want to promote and it, within a city or within a built environment context, what are the initiatives we have? And I break it down very simply to four basic things. There is issue of nature conservation, trying to conserve the natural capital that we have. There's issues of restoration, which is to restore the ecosystem services pretty much in its pristine conditions. And as we move closer to cities, we actually need to think about rehabilitation of degraded natural environment. Rehabilitation because it needs to coexist with the built environment. And finally, biomimicry. How do you now reintroduce and recreate the very key beneficial processes of natural processes and have that embedded into our urban environment. I'll start with the, the, uh, what happens out away from the city, not up in the catchment. The focus of our intervention has got to be conservation and restoration. Conservation, for example, in this wonderful close catchment that supplies water to the city of Melbourne. Conserving the nature, uh, the natural growth forest uh, has a significant ecosystem services in the way it cleanses the water that is now fundamental to the supply of uh, water to Melbourne. The type of treatment that we treat that water to drinking standard is rudimentary, simple sand filtration because the catchment is doing all the work. But there is restoration, how we can progressively actually think about those catchments and restore perhaps pasture land back into forests. So those are some of the initiatives that we could think about. As we get closer to the city, we find that our focus will change from a restoration, from conservation and restoration to restoration and rehabilitation. The growth and regeneration of mangrove is to some degree a restoration. But there are some similar efforts of trying to prevent erosion and promoting sedimentation to prevent that. That is a rehabilitation process whereby we are, to some degree, trying to now adapt a natural system into an urban environment. And finally, when we are in the city, we are now moving to rehabilitation and biomimicry. And I want to talk about biomimicry because, to some degree, it pretty much defines my career uh, in, in, in research and academia over the past 20 years. Is the type of work we do to understand the key natural processes that we want to capture and then reconfiguring it into an urban form, into an urban environment. 
you have heard a lot now of great initiatives of greening, re-greening cities. And you would have missed that opportunity to do so in a, in a really strong, meaningful way if you simply went out and plant trees. You actually need to think about what are some of the natural processes that you want to promote. The use of urban wetlands and the scale that you can see from the picture actually shows how the process of cleansing of an urban wetland can actually be adapted to a whole range of scale within a cityscape, right down to what you do in the streets. And when you connect those open spaces with green corridors, you immediately provide safe passage of flood water and also provide microclimate influences into the urban environment. And why are they important with my last slide here is that in fact, the built environment cities can now be designed to provide ecosystem services to the humankind, to the built environment, as well as in protecting and buffering the impact of urbanization to the adjoining natural environment. Some of the key things we need to think about on what the natural processes we want to deliver, water quality, water quality improvement, and if we can improve the quality of water that falls onto our city, we can manage that as a resource. And that provides us with resilience from drought. It provides us resilience from urban pollution, buffering aquatic ecosystems from the impact of urbanization. If you connect those green space into corridors, we provide flood mitigation work. And in providing flood mitigation work, we start to influence the microclimate through our green fingers and green corridors throughout the city. And finally, if we actually create a corridors of urban ecology and biodiversity, we introduce resilience into how we actually deal with our health. Vectors and diseases and the importance of biodiversity to actually manage those issues. So I'd just like to finish there by basically saying this thing, that Nature-based solutions have a very important role in combination with traditional grey infrastructure. Urban design and urban planning provides the platform for their integration. Understanding the different natural processes that we want to capture and biomimic into urban design is where future cities are going to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. And again, I'd like to uh, especially thank you for carrying forward the link I was trying to make between um, urban resilience and internal or social resilience and livable cities and sustainability. So thank you. Um, our final presentation will be delivered by David Simmons, who will um, share with us different methods and tools for better risk management to increase the resilience of industry and the built environment with a special focus on financing. Over to you, David. Excellent. Um, well, firstly, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm going to thought I'd start before I actually cover the topic by giving you a bit of background about the insurance industry for disasters, or as we call it, catastrophes. I'm a mathematician by background, and I started working in insurance a number of years ago, many years ago. And I must admit, I thought it would give me a good, good combination of mathematical risk analysis and business. I was totally wrong. All right? It was very, very boring. It was very, very dull. It was very, very bureaucratic. In, in, in seeking something more interesting, I went into what we call reinsurance. That's the insurance of insurance companies for natural disasters, for, uh, for catastrophes, for earthquakes, for floods, for tropical cyclones. Thinking, look, there's billions of dollars of cover being granted for these things. There must be a more analytical approach. Totally wrong. Again, we had almost no data. So the thing, this thing, we were bracing these things on almost no information. And guess what happened? What happened was the market almost died. 25 years ago, though, after a series of losses culminating in Hurricane Andrew, it looked like the, the global catastrophe reinsurance market was going to collapse. Now, 25 years later, I'm still here, and the reinsurance market for catastrophe risk is still here. Now, why is that? In fact, it's more than still here. It's healthier than it's ever been. In fact, we have a different problem at the moment. We have too much capital in the market. We have too many reinsurers chasing too few risks. So how has that happened? It's happened by the appliance of science. It's happened by us engaging with academia, engaging with engineers to understand the risks we have. That's understanding 
as this little chart shows behind me, the, uh, the exposure, so what are we actually covering? Typically, it used to be buildings. I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Where are they? If we're covering flood, it matters if the building's at the top of a hill or, or by the side of a river. We need to know where they are explicitly. We need to understand how they're built and how they would react to an event. We need to understand what those events could be. How frequent are they? How big can they be? They may be much bigger than we've ever observed in the past. And we need to understand how vulnerable our exposure is to those events and what the financial consequences of that event is going to be. And by going this process of segmentation, we're beginning to understand exactly how the risks work. Now, I'm a risk modeler. If any modeler stands in front of you and says they have the perfect model, they're ever a, either a fool or a charlatan or both. Okay, no model is perfect. But what models are, are test beds for sets of assumptions. And we begin to build the best assumptions we can and follow those through to a logical conclusion and then test different assumptions. By doing that, we understand the risk much, much better. And now that's why the, the industry has got so resilient. Another bit of background, financial crash of 2008, 2009. Capital markets were desperate for new things to invest in, things that weren't correlated with other financial risks. They looked at the catastrophe reinsurance market and thought, hey, these guys got it cracked. They, they understand the risk. Now, there were things around in the past called cat bonds. Um, Disneyland in Tokyo, for example, famously issued a cat bond probably about 20 years ago. So, um, these things work by issuing a bond which pays an enhanced return, an enhanced coupon, but the investor could lose all their money if a defined event occurs. At least defined event may be something that can happen every 50 years, every 100 years, even now every 20 years. But the, the amount of money they, they get every year is increased because of that. Now, there's been a massive inflow of pension fund money, for example, into this market. Specialist companies have been set up called catastrophe funds. Those catastrophe funds manage billions of dollars of capital. And increasingly, they've created their own insurance companies. Reinsurance companies... But by, as it, uh, it, to react to this, have created their own capital market vehicles. And reinsurance brokers, such as my company, Willis Towers Watson, have also created their own capital market teams. Now, it's probably worth saying here what a, what a reinsurance broker does. Now, your, your experience of a broker, I guess, is a guy who fixes your car insurance. We do much more than just trying to get the best price for our clients. So that's part of the job. Indeed, if you're a governmental client buying risk, you owe it to your citizens, your taxpayers, to get the best possible deal you can. Our job is to analyze that risk. The first models for Windstorm were built by reinsurance brokers. In fact, I personally built the first European Windstorm model, for example, 20 years ago. So our job is actually to advise our clients what risks they have and how they manage those risks. Do they try to improve those risks? Or do they pass the financial consequences of a loss to somebody else, to a third party? Now, what does this all mean? Um, well, the excess capacity in the reinsurance market means that catastrophe risk insurance, disaster insurance, has never been so cheap. Right? So it's the cheapest it ever has been, particularly for developing markets. So if you're in a market where a reinsurer has little existing capacity, they are desperate for that, for that uh, business because it has little capital implication for them to write it. But there is a one, one really big failure in, all in this story. We don't cover the people who most need it. We typically cover the rich, the middle classes, companies. We cover property and profit. We do not cover the poor. The poor have at least to lose in capital terms, but the most to lose in every other term, losing lives, livelihoods, and places to live. So we need to address that issue. We're beginning to address it now. We also actually don't do very well about covering government risk. So governments typically don't insure their assets. They don't insure their infrastructure. They don't insure their people. They don't insure the consequences of these events and the fact that services such as education, health, and central services can be disrupted. So these things aren't covered. We also don't cover ecosystems. Both ecosystems that protect us, like reefs and mangroves, or ecosystems that provide tourist income, or even ecosystems for their intrinsic value, for, for what they are and how irreplaceable they are. So 
the insurance mechanism, which I'm going to talk about, and I'm using insurance in the broadest sense here, is not just about financial restitution. Yes, it is. Um, we do know that um, after an event that many studies have shown that the more insurance bought in the country, the quicker the recovery. For example, if you compare New Zealand after the Christchurch earthquakes, they actually found that uh, their, their economic activity increased after the earthquake because of all the inflow of money from the international markets. Who have compared that to Haiti, where they're still suffering years and years after an event. So the more insurance you have, the better it's going to be. But I would argue the real value of an insurance process is that process of risk understanding, understanding what you could lose, understanding what could happen, and therefore trying to build appropriate responses. Also try to find ways to prioritize where you should spend your money. Should you spend your money improving this risk? If this risk is hard to improve, how do you get around the financial consequences and human consequences of this thing being damaged? This is, I say, it's particularly true of governments. Governments actually need to begin to understand. They owe a, a duty to their citizens, sometimes even a legal duty, to make sure they protect them against things that can happen. Also, after, very often, governments rely on post-disaster funding, which may be them issuing loans or uh, issuing bonds or borrowing from the markets, or it may be from aid money coming in from outside. Trouble is that after an event, your, your sovereign rating may go down, so the cost of borrowing goes up. And aid money is often promised, but doesn't always arrive. And if it arrives, it arrives late. So we need to be more robust. We need to have more control locally. I'm going to talk very quickly about a number of schemes and initiatives which are, which are happening at the moment. The first is CRIF, the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. That was created in 2007 after Hurricane Ivan waxed through the Caribbean, causing immense damage. Aid money was promised, some of it arrived. If it arrived, it arrived late. They needed to have something which actually guaranteed that money got to countries quickly and also had a degree of control. So the countries weren't so dependent on overseas aid. There was actually this process was owned within the country. So they created a special purpose vehicle, a special insurance company, which actually will responds to the needs of their policyholders. And they went through a period actually in the, in the Caribbean with relatively few hurricanes. Because this company held all the profit, they were able to then reduce the price of the insurance they offered to the countries. And when they did have a bad year in 2017, they were able to pay and actually also not increase the price by very much the following year. Another example is ARC, African Risk Capacity. As the name implies, African Risk Capacity aims to build capacity as well as apply insurance. So for ARC, you cannot join African Risk Capacity unless you go through a period of risk training. So if a country applies, they have to spend six months with ARC team, actually understanding their risk, understanding who could be who could be affected, what an appropriate response could be after a disaster, to make sure that money is efficiently used. Another example, here in the Philippines, we've been working recently with the ADB and also with the Department of Finance on a scheme called PCDIP, which is actually a a property a, a pool covering cities in the Philippines. Now, the idea here is that cities run like Perif and Arc. It's cities club together rather than governments clubbing together to share their risk. That means, again, the aim is to get money to them quickly after an event, but because they're sharing their risk, they don't actually have to pass so much profit and uncertainty load, which is in, in every premium you buy, to the international markets. That's actually held within the pool for the benefits of the policyholders. So it's an efficient way of doing things. We're also currently working on something with Marfund. Marfund is a group of four agencies from Belize, Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras covering the Mesoamerican Reef. The aim of that process is to try and work out what an appropriate cover would be to actually restore that reef after a hurricane event. And there's a lot of interest. This is the year of the reef uh, in, in this year. And there's a lot of interest in reef coverage, not just tropical cyclones, but also potentially bleaching cover. So can you actually find insurance against bleaching? Um, as we're running short of time, I'll, I'll miss the next couple of examples and jump to the conclusion. I think um, 
the insurance industry is ready to help here. We have actually, actually created a mechanism called the Insurance Development Forum. We realize that the, this works. If we can help governments and cities and other institutions to actually to enter this market, engage in the insurance process, we need to break down the barriers. And those barriers could be lack of modeling, lack of data. It could be regulatory issues or legal issues. So the group of insurers, the World Bank and the UN have got together to create this vehicle, which was launched this year in London with a new Secretary General who's just started to actually to help uh, governments and multilateral institutions such as the ADB and the World Bank to deliver um, unbiased advice on this on risk transfer and appropriate modeling mechanisms for governments and cities. We need to apply the knowledge that we have gained in the private sector about how we have turned our industry into something which is almost broken, into something which is now very resilient to cities and, the, and broader populations. We need to make sure we don't miss those people who need this, in this process the most. We are working at the moment, for example, with the um, IFC on a scheme in Fiji to provide insurance for the poor. So if a, if a tropical cyclone or an earthquake hits Fiji above a certain intensity, a cash payment will be made to identified individuals and families. But it's not, all, it's not just about numbers, as I said, it's actually also about process, about risk understanding, and actually finding a system to actually help, help cities and countries and people become more resilient. Now, insurance is not a sticking plaster. Insurance is, I'm not going to stand in front of you and say, look, you guys need insurance. Sometimes insurance isn't appropriate, but very often it is, and the insurance mechanism very often it is. But it has to be part of an, of an integrated risk management process. So you need to think about insurance in the context of what we're trying to do as a society, as a country, as a city, not just on its own. And then final point, risk pooling. I say a lot of my time is spent creating risk pools and reinsuring risk pools. It's a very good idea. If you actually have like-minded people, like-minded cities, like-minded countries who you can share your risk with, create a special purpose vehicle or a mutual, and then share those risks and then reinsure that mutual, you have a much more effective and much more robust system. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. And um, uh, myself being responsible for our operations in the Pacific, your presentation was of keen interest to me. Um, I think you're aware we've structured a couple of contingent financing instruments for countries in the Pacific. But what res resonated the most was what you said about, um, you know, even though the catastrophic risk insurance is now less expensive than almost it's ever been, um, the insurance doesn't cover the most vulnerable. And you mentioned the poor, often governments in the public sector, as well as natural ecosystems. So again, that's, that's a big challenge. Um, the other challenge we have is we've got 15 minutes left um, for this session, uh, but we want to open it up for some questions from all of you. We've got a great set of panelists who've covered a lot of different areas. Um, so I think right now the floor is open for any questions. Yes, and your hand came up first. Yes, sir. You, in the blue shirt. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Cornelio from Cebu City, Philippines. Uh, my question is for Tony. Uh, you presented earlier uh, examples of ecosystem services. Uh, I'd like to know if the payment for in ecosystem services has been employed in, this, in these cases, and if so, how can this be replicated in other cities of Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. Yes, this, the, the, one, one of the first things that I need to acknowledge is that a lot of the ecosystem services are uh, multiple benefit, bring, deliver multiple benefits, and there are market valuation as well as non-market valuation that needs to come together. So you find that there are uh, uh, the, the calculation of the economic value of, of introducing nature-based solutions in cities is a combination of looking at how you could apportion uh, individual private benefits as well as community benefits. And the payment for them quite often are broken up into what could be readily passed on to individual direct beneficiaries and what government actually would uh, assume for the community in terms of a community benefit. So what, what, what 
is being done in the research is actually going through and documenting the market and non-market valuation of the benefits of reduced temperature, improved water quality, water harvesting. Now that's a that's a commodity that could be that, that has a market value to it. Flood management and how that is tied to uh, uh, flood flood cost reduction. And finally, urban heat mitigation tied to the health sector in terms of reduction in hospital admissions for, for heat strokes and so on. So that, that it, it is complex because of the multiple benefits uh, and government do need to take a, a, a lead role in determining how the private sector can actually participate in, in, in the delivering of that infrastructure. Great, thanks Tony. You still have a question. Um, come forward, you can use the mic up here. And maybe you can introduce yourself, and if you want to ask a specific panelist, just say so. Uh, my name is Bojang Darmaji. I am a senior advisor with the Save the Earth Cambodia. This question is more, like, rather it's a clarification that I would uh, appreciate on insurance that was made here, presentation. Uh, while we understand and appreciate that insurance is one of the key sort of adaptation options that uh, that's on the board, um, we also understand the kinds of issues under insurance and essentially when we're talking about some of the countries in Asia, the developing countries where uh, livestock people and not even agricultural crops have insurance. While some governments are still coming up with some pharma credit cards and other kinds of options. But I understand that uh, in your work with IFC in Fiji that you could provide some uh, payments to the affected people. While that's Fiji is a, uh, one of the islands, certainly it's welcome. But my sort of an observation here is how do we address this question of um, uh, larger kind of um, people getting um, uh, sort of uh, the advantage of insurance? And the question is who is going to pay? Thank you. So David, this is for you. Yeah, um, that's a very, very good question and actually covered one thing which actually I did avoid talking about, um, which is the whole issue of affordability. And that's the problem for our insurance of the poor. I mean, it's very difficult. For example, we, we're involved in a number of micro insurance schemes covering farming, not so much in Asia, to be fair, in Africa. Um, there you can have some creative solutions. So something we're doing for the World um, Food Programme, farmers have the option to pay for their premium by work, by working for their community. But in practice, because somebody has to pay for that premium. And that's always, it's, to the extent it comes down to donor money. And actually, donors have been uncomfortable funding premium. Uh, they're quite comfortable funding loans, and they call it concessional finance. They're not quite so keen funding premiums. So we're now calling it concessional insurance. right? So, But it's, uh, there's an interesting uh, dis dichotomy here. But it's an interesting point. How do we to get around this challenge? I think it will be a combination of probably sometimes government money, coming in. So the Fiji example is going to be started, at least initially, by just the government paying the premium. And to be fair, some of that government premium is probably coming from external donors. Right? So there, is going to be, there has to be external finance coming in. But you, you hope to get a virtuous cycle. I mean, an example, a guy who's director of African Risk Capacity, which is one of our clients, he's, far, he's an actuary, but his father is a poor farmer in Zimbabwe. And he always says that his father cannot afford to use all his seed in any one year because if the crop fails, he needs, he needs to have something to feed his family. And also, hopefully, if some's less, some is left to plant for the following year. If he had insurance, then he could actually perhaps afford to sow all his seed. If the crop works, he has, then has a greater amount of, a greater amount of um, things to sell. And actually, that means he can perhaps buy even more next year. So you get to a position where, no, he can't, can't afford the premium now, but hopefully in the over a period of time, he may get to a position where he can afford the premium. So I think you're absolutely right. And this is actually where a lot of thought needs, to, creative thought needs to come in, particularly amongst the donor community, about how we actually get this virtuous cycle moving. Well, thank you for that great question and your excellent answer, David, and I hope it gives ADB some food for thought moving forward. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. We need some women to ask some questions too, so next next round will be women. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Akhtar Yamansano. I'm from Save the Earth Cambodia. I'm also working for one of the SPCR projects, the Strategic Program for Climate Resilience. And very much connecting to this. And I have also experience for ISO system certification for industries. 
So I see there is a relation between the industry and resilience. One of the presentations we have seen the, the on to introduce resilience, environmental uh, engineering solutions to resilience. So if we look at industrial perspectives, then the industrialist is not going to invest $1 if they don't see something visible. Because profit need to see first before investment. But if we look at resilience perspectives, then there is no structure yet how resilience look like. From the Pacific area, the resilience is one, and the Asia inside the resilience in another. The countries at higher risk with earthquake, their resilience is another. So my, my common question to anyone is, do you have, do you think about is there any structure, some common minimum criteria that have to have for an industry particular when we think for its resilience? This is question one. Second one, recommendation. I know we don't have the solution yet. Next, upon like now the sixth, the seventh upon, may we wish to see a resilience framework that talks about very specific drought resilience, flood resilience, tsunami resilience, earthquake resilience, or industry resilience, so that we, the people before going for investment, before going for thinking, they know what it looks like. For example, if I look at this pen, we can introduce this is resi pen, but how we can introduce resilience? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I think I'll ask Mark to. Uh, yeah, it's, an extra crack. yeah. Uh, it's it's against that sort of challenge that we've developed both the city resilience framework for Rockefeller, which is all, that's all open source, so everyone can download that. It's over $4 million of research. Um, and uh, whilst I can't answer your question from an industrial perspective, I got the same challenge from a water perspective, and that's why we applied a water lens and started looking. And we think that that sort of approach, whilst we can move to the other contexts or the context of other systems, it might be energy, it might be industry, or it might be transport, we think that same sort of approach of a bit more of a deep dive so it's more directly relevant to that sector, whilst acknowledging um, you can't, uh, that, that sector interacts with all the other sectors or systems uh, that's fundamental so that's the first pl place i could direct you to the city resilience framework and subsequently as we are producing because we're, we're in the middle of the pilots the work specifically on water and you might be able to learn something that might help uh, inform your thinking on industry okay thanks mark maybe i'll ask esther to maybe share something from the tcf perspective esther um, regarding your questions, I would like to uh, re-emphasize the, the five areas of opportunities. And TCF mentioned about the resource efficiency and energy sources and product services and market and resilience. And you mentioned about the ISO certification. I think that's the I think the really good initiatives to start with. Uh, that means you are already concerning about the the. The, the environmental and energy issues. And to get the certification, you are already ready for many areas to uh, fit the, the requirement. So I think it's a really good start. And uh, regarding the resource efficiency, um, like let me think about the building efficiency, uh, for example, as in just minor examples. So uh, a lot of companies, um, even though you are from a government entities, but from companies' perspective, they are trying to uh, build up the efficiency of their own buildings by uh, replacing the lights and by just constructing, not uh, for the just minor equipment, but from the construction uh, processes, they would like to uh, build more resilient building and sustainable. Uh, just so they are concerning uh, from the the beginning of the you know the construction uh, the developing the designing uh, construction stages so I think um, I would like to ap uh, uh, apply the opportunity parts to your uh, projects 
Thanks a lot, Esther. I'm going to um, allow for one more question, assuming there is a question, and then I'm going to ask each of our panelists to uh, give us a, a quick one sentence takeaway before I close the session. So is there any other question from anybody? The floor is open. Wow. No questions? Well, maybe I'll move straight to the um, takeaways because it is getting close to three o'clock. Um, and uh, perhaps I'll begin on my left with Mark. We're keeping the food for thought takeaway. <laughs> um, the conference is about avoiding the worst impacts. And my takeaway is saying sometimes if you just assume the worst and think through how you'd cope, it can be invaluable in helping inform your approach. Thanks for that, Mark. Esther. Um, yesterday, I arrived at the, the day before. I arrived here, and I joined the conference from yesterday. I met quite a lot of people, but no one really know about the TCFD. So uh, I would like to just reemphasize that adopting TCFD is a long journey. It's not a, uh, it means we, uh, we are not really requesting any radical changes. By discussing uh, the climate issues on our board level or management levels or uh, among the colleagues, you can start uh, to think about the, the adoption. And then um, uh, the most important thing is it doesn't cost anything to join the TCFD as a supporters. Uh, I hope this APM forum uh, could be a momentum to increase awareness uh, in this region and to get the more strong support from Asia. And if you have any questions about TCFD, you can feel free to contact me or send an email to secretariat at uh, fsb tcfd.org. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Tony. Yes, uh, I guess my take home message uh, from a city perspective and the role of nature based solution uh, is that in a city, we are often dealing with multiple resilient objectives across many, many different sectors. And nature-based solutions, when combined with gray infrastructure, offers a great opportunity to deliver multiple outputs and therefore multiple resilience outcomes uh, if designed through the, the prism of capturing them, biomimicry, and introducing that through a design platform. Thanks, Tony. Shampu? Thank you very much, Jim. And before I um, uh, share my takeaway, maybe I just uh, make one comment to, in response to the question raised by the Cambodian uh, delegate. I think I understand your sort of maybe um, frustration or confusion, you know, what does resilience smell or look like? You know, we, we are here talking about resilience. Can you tell me what it is? So this is, um, I think, something uh, probably we should have done a better job in terms of uh, conceptualization at the beginning. But again, if you are part of the pilot program for climate resilience, um, I think you're probably much more informed than some of the other delegates here. So I think it's a very unfortunately context-specific concept. And in our context, the ADB, we do lots of infrastructure investment. So for us, um, resilience means what a highway, what a port is designed to do to develop, to deliver some very basic development uh, objectives. It will still be able to do so in a different climate. So that's, uh, you know, in a very sort of practical terms, that's what we meant by resilience. And if a heavy rain comes, if a landslide comes, the, the, the highway will still be able to provide the transportation service. And then again, for a farmer, if, if it can still pro provide enough for the family in a drought year, um, as it in a normal year, then that's resilience. So it's a very uh, con context specific uh, concept. I think there's uh, absolutely a lot to learn in terms of develop different criteria. And it is a very, very much uh, area of active research and the debate. Um, so watch the space, I guess. Uh, come back to the takeaway, I think um, adopting and implementing new policies and regulations 
is very messy and is disruptive, uh, inconvenient, sometimes costly, but invest in resilience will, um, uh, will be awarded handsomely, I think, longer term. Thanks a lot, Shampoo. And uh, the last word goes to David. Well, actually, all I can say is actually, I would not stand on this, well, sit there on this, on this panel and say the insurance solution, had, the insurance industry has all the solutions we don't. But coming to the comments the other panelists have made, we do actually, over the last 25 years, have built a framework for assisting actually to understand risk and actually provide a pot, like a, something to help you make decisions about where you need to invest and where you need to protect. Now, we can actually, the industry stands ready to do that for two reasons. Number one, it needs new business, so that's a dirty financial reason, but also actually wants to help. It really wants to help the industry. And actually, the creation of the Insurance Development Forum is one, one manifestation of that. That group is ready to help any government in this room or anywhere to help them actually understand how a solution could help them. And we're working very closely with people like the German government, KFW, um, and BMZ uh, with their Insure Resilient Solutions Fund, which actually has a pot of 15 million euros available to help fund such work. So we are ready and we're available and we can and want to help you. Thank you, David. And um, now I'd like to ask all of you to uh, join me in uh, giving a round of applause to our panelists. Um, and yeah, big, big thanks to all of you for joining us afternoon. I thought this was a very informative session and um, I wish you the best in your continued uh, participation in APAN. Thank you very much.